I think we are live. Welcome everyone to this first edition of the WooClap Education Summit 2021, hosted by WooClap, of course, an international event of a day with 16 live sessions in three languages, yet French, English, and Spanish. And this year, we've got more than 30 speakers and over a thousand participants. And today, we're aiming to bring together teachers, edtech innovators, and experts from all over the world to discuss current and future issues within education, and of course, to, to compare our points of view. So thank you all for being here today. My name is Annalise, Head of Expansion at WooClap. And for those amongst our audience who don't know WooClap just yet, here's some interesting information I'd love to share with you all. So WooClap is an edtech company that develops two tools. We have the WooClap platform, an online platform, of course, which, thanks to its 15 types of questions, allows teachers to interact and measure the comprehension rate of their students. And then we have a second tool called WooFlash. And this platform allows you to follow the progress of your students, create personalized learning paths to accompany them in their revisions. And of course, we integrate into different virtual learning environments, such as Moodle, Canvas, and more. And today, more than 500,000 teachers around the world use our platforms, whether in classroom, remotely, or even asynchronously. And furthermore, dear audience, I invite you all to send your questions and reactions to this session in the chat. And if you'd like to share the event on social media, feel free to do so. And you can use the hashtag WooClab Education Summit. All right. This webinar will last about 45 minutes. And I have the pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Emma Pounceford and Scott Hayden. But before I let you introduce yourselves, Emma and Scott, I will launch a WooClap question first for our dearest audience to, to respond to. And here it is. So please connect yourselves through scanning the QR code you see on the screen, or just hit the link in the chat to participate. And then we can just hop on or question don't worry if you do not see that QR code appearing anymore. You can just go ahead and click on the link in the chat. And here we are. In your opinion, what is the impact that education technology will have on the teacher's role evolution? And again, to participate to this voting, please click on the link in the chat. And so whilst our audience is responding to our live voting, please, Emma, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Thank you, Annalisa. Thank you for the warm welcome. And it's a huge, huge pleasure to be here today, along with Scott. My name is Dr. Emma Pulsfort. I'm based over in the UK with Scott as well. And I'm a learning science practitioner and also founder of Delecti, an education consultancy that's based in the gorgeous Georgian city of Bath. And the mission of Delecti is to empower educators and learners with teaching and learning toolkits to thrive in 21st century society. Look at that. Thank you, Emma. And Scott, please feel free to introduce yourself as well. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott. I'm a teacher from Basingstoke in Hampshire. And as well as being a teacher, I'm also in charge of digital learning at our college, which is a, a general further education college and helps students with learning needs, students who learn differently, as well as students who are studying vocational subjects such as barbering, engineering, automotive, creativity, uh, and all sorts of other hands-on subjects, as well as academic subjects as well, like science. So quite a diverse bunch. I also work 
for the Department for Education in England, helping to train other schools and colleges around the country in using wonderful tools like WooClap and other edtech as well. So it's my job to sort of help people use technology to improve teaching and learning. Perfect. Thank you, Scott. And thank you both for being with us today. And in the meantime, we have our audience answers coming in. Very interesting insights. And I see constant engagement, innovation, creativity, enablement to, to really spend more time with students and develop effective and impactful learning. And I'd like to go and, and, and start with this, actually, because we're here today to discuss EdTech and its impact on the teacher for evolution. And I would love to start with a first question to you as well as with it to the audience. How does EdTech's development impact the teacher's role? Meaning what will be expected of them in the next few years? And let's start with you, Scott. What are your insights you'd like to share with us on this topic? Good answers coming through on the Woo Clap as well, wasn't there? In terms of what, how things are going to evolve and change. Yes. What I, what I, yeah, I would lovely to see that. So, what I believe will be the big development, I suppose, will be this move to the personal. What I mean by that is an emphasis on valuing the one to ones, the mentoring, the coaching, the bits that we remember in the classroom from when we were at school and college and university your teacher sits down next to you and that's when the synapses really connect from hands-on activities um experiences conversations i think edtech frees up time for us i think by utilizing edtech to have more flipped and blended approaches before during and after the actual lessons i think our lesson time is going to be more and more focused on those human aspects of pedagogy that can never be automated and conversations. I think about. I think about this the other day, actually, about um, my lecturer Paul Dimitri Crane at University of Surrey, and those conversations, those little focus groups, those chats we would have in the classroom, and they were those campfire style uh, watering hole moments, as it were. They were so formative to me. And I think about our students coming back after lockdown, how much they valued that aspect of education that. And I like to think we're, we're pretty good at using technology at our college, but there's certain parts of uh, teaching, learning and assessment that are so valuable to do face to face and that human aspect. And technology is never a replacement for that. It's an enhancement and augmentation of it. And I really feel that in the classroom, in the physical classroom, if I'm asking my students to get on the train or get a bus or to travel in and to be physically in the classroom, I've got to be doing live action um unmissable undeniable learning that can only be done in person so there's a real of uh, i suppose increased value and an increased understanding of the importance of human interaction in the classroom i think is what we're going to get from this that's great thank you scott emma would you like to to share your opinion on this matter I Thank you. No, I'd, thank you so much, Scott. I think you, you hit the nail on the head with personalization, right? And we talk about the power of technology to personalize learning. But as, as you say, that human connection and the way in which humans are, you know, we as individuals are uniquely placed to inspire and also respond. And that is where it's going to be a very, very long time before you have that conversational assistant who can so spontaneously pick apart the nuances of what's happening and what challenges a student is facing at any particular time. And I think that's the real, that's the real vision, isn't it? The point we want to get to whereby the possibilities of flipped learning or blended learning, whereby content can be uh, delivered in that those bite-sized chunks and we can think about mastery learning and putting in those blocks and I'll come back to that idea a little bit more later, uh, can be taken charge of by material that can be uh, progressed through by students at their own pace whilst we are freed up within the classroom setting whether that's at primary, secondary, at university and adult education, further education, to give that time and, and attention, which is 
impossible without those technologies. And I think at this point, we can think about what other technologies have already done this for us. So the textbook, that's, you know, we sort of forget what an extraordinary technology the textbook was that gave that ability to give each individual, each learner content in front of them. And that's really what we're doing and we're thinking about with, you know, whether it's Khan Academy or other platforms where, whereby we have the curriculum there. It's, you know, it's, the, it's that textbook, but that's of course much more dynamic. So in some absolutely, yeah, Scott, thank you for uh, bringing us so quickly to that point of personalization. And ultimately what, you know, ed education is, is furthering human knowledge and imparting human knowledge. So, they, so they, we can't take the human out of that clearly. Thank you, Emma, for this for this lovely, lovely addition, because we see that technology is really an enhancement for teachers. Exactly. Do you think that teachers will have a more individual approach to this? I think so. I think I think about myself when I was ever this year when I've gone back in, into the classroom teaching, I've gone more to like a conversational um personal relationship aspect the approach to mentoring my students and coaching as it were and that's strange how that's happened organically and I find that other teachers I've supported have found that as well that we've we are realizing now that there's so many parts of what we do whereby we can use Twitter for hashtag debates or we can use WooClap or Nearpod or other tools for live action dynamic interaction like you've just done with people from the Philippines and Brazil and Germany there of Eloise. Um, so it's making us realize, if we haven't realized before, that there's lots of things we can do before and after sessions, as it were, to be like the cartilage or the bits that segue the learning, the building blocks, as Emma so wonderfully put it, in terms of connecting the tapestry of learning, as it were. So I really feel like from my personal experience and from what I've, what I've observed working with 70 schools and colleges last year across the country is that teachers are now more cognizant of how valuable that face-to-face -face time is and are determined to use it well for practical hands-on constructing um, learning by actually doing as it were particularly in our vocational lessons whereby they've realized so much how much of the theory how much of the imparting of knowledge and how much of the interactivity can actually be done outside of lessons or after or sometimes during as well. I mean, this isn't um, a replacement for the actual physical timetabled lesson as you're doing right now. You're doing a little flipped blended activity with us right now with these pop up woo claps. And we're starting to realize how this is actually freeing up a bit of time for us as well. Our English and maths teachers in particular have realized how utilizing machine learning tools like Century and other aspects of EdTech, they are realizing that the students are coming to their lesson with like a personal dashboard of in things that they need um, to have coaching and training on. And it's actually making us focus our time with more intention and purpose to practice towards that, the mastery again, which um, Emma mentioned earlier on, that autonomy, as it were, is being given to our teachers we're realizing by using these tools they're realizing actually i've got a bit more time now if i've used these tools effectively i've got a bit more time in my scheme of work for me to focus on one-to-ones and when we talk to the students and do our research with them all 70 of the schools and colleges we've supported the one thing they want more of is more one-to-one -one time with their teacher we've found that is unanimous across you know, primary schools to colleges and it's not, they're not yearning for any one more what, bit of tech more than any other, because ultimately students don't see it as ed tech. They just see it as learning. They don't think I'm learning, doing flips learning now or blended learning. They're just learning. They always curate and forage and gather from numerous different sources to learn, whether it be a textbook, whether it be a podcast. And I think what I really want is to get to a point whereby we no longer talk about things like, Ed tech, to be honest with you, it's just learning. It's just uh, part of the toolkit. I like post it or woo clap uh, one and the same. Definitely, Emma. Would you like to react on that? Yeah, I, just as you were talking, Scott, it made me think about learning environments as well. And I think mm. one of the 
challenges that we have, especially over this pandemic period, is where we're mediating our professional activity, our teaching and learning, our social activity, all in one place. And we know from neuroscience and the learning sciences more broadly that we best learn when we shift our environments and we create memories in different environments and how we and map some of the activities according to where we are and what activities we are doing. So that, I think, has thrown up this whole experience over the past 15 months, has really thrown that into relief because we now see that, yes, there are, yes, we can deliver, say, chunks of content, but as it, when it comes to depth of learning and depth of understanding, that is much, much harder to deliver through uh, digital tools in that responsive way. And as you were saying, Scott, absolutely, I, I, I completely agree with you that, that the, the value that comes from that one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction as well and the way in which uh, the time has been freed up, I think it's been really valuable. And of course, shown into relief as we're all uh, yearning to have more uh, sort of 3D interaction, whatever it might be for teaching, learning or other purposes. Absolutely. Um, is it Thornburg? I don't know. He said about the learning environments. You reminded me of it. He says, I mentioned it earlier on, didn't I? The watering hole, um, the cave for independent learning, um, the campfire and the mountaintop. Uh, whether we're online or whether we're in real life, I think having those different environments that are facilitated by the teacher, as Eloisa said in the comments there actually about experiences, I think that's absolutely what, what we strive for these different spaces and environments and we've seen the way our students behave differently in breakout rooms for example when there's less people listening or watching they might turn their mic on and actually hold court as it were um, providing those differentiated spaces particularly for different levels of ability we're starting to see some people thrive who otherwise might have got um, forgotten or left behind and that's been a really interesting unintended consequence of this um, access, I suppose, to these different platforms over the last year or so. Some students have actually emerged and found a voice in a way that they're familiar with, which has been lovely to see. Thank you, Scott. So if I'm hearing all this, can we state that teachers will go to what being that learning coach for students to go really Yes, to, to go to that depth of learning and understanding. Go on, Emma, you go first. Sure. Uh, yeah, it, it, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Because then we come to this question of coaching in what, and that's something that we've already been uh, discussing in the lead up to this summit. It's so it, we, we then delve into this uh, controversy where people see there's two camps of either you're learning knowledge, uh, information how, or domain knowledge, or we're talking about metacognition and knowing about knowing and deeper learning. And I think it, it's a bit of, it's, it's both, right? Because it comes back to this, this question of, so mastery learning, what is it? It's having the fundamentals, but having the ability to come back to those fundamentals uh, at a later stage, um, should it be necessary? And one of the, the case studies that uh, I wanted to bring forward uh, today was the, 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 the instances that we have across so many different sectors where this has become so, so important, this ability to revisit and rethink. So we have one example from Adam Grant's book, Think Again, that was uh, published earlier this year. And he talks about the firefighter Wagner Dodge and his uh, ability to rethink what it meant to battle with this wildfire fire. Now his training had told him either uh, tackle the fire or outrun it, neither were possible. So he stopped and rethought, lit the ground around him, put a, a water soaked cloth over his mouth and put lay on the ground. And he was one of the few members of his team who actually uh, survived at that point. So this, it, what did this show? And we uh, draw on other uh, similar case studies uh, that maybe we'll come back to later. It shows that the uh, what do we need to be able to do uh, to really flourish personally and professionally? It's to um, revisit and rethink what we think we know. So uh, coming back to this question, then if I can cycle back to the role of the teacher, then it is of course it's I, I'm no enemy of direct instruction and supporting that. It's the ability to coach and 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 
guide and encourage and be that curator and gatekeeper of the right tools that can support that sort of development as well as that metacognitive piece as well and developing of course intrinsic motivation in in students ultimately because once they fly the sort of formal education nests it's going to be our responsibilities throughout our whole lives to continue continually relearn and revisit what we know and think so i think the question of the coach and the uh, a coach in in what and what elements i think is a really interesting one the idea of coaching is something i keep thinking about a lot um in relation to training up and coaching staff something which is a large part of my role and also with students as well so I found that I can't ignore the fact that the, the way I've learned and the way we all learn best as far as I can see, and I might be wrong, is those connections and those one-to-ones. And of course, you know, logistically, it isn't possible for one teacher to provide that in the way we'd all like to for all of our learners, particularly in some schools that've got large numbers of students to get around and spend time with. But I, I think about those bits in lessons I remember when I was at school, college, and I've talked to the students now and the bits that connect with them are when the students sit with them, you know, knee to knee, as it were, and talk to them and really go through. That's when things start to connect. Um, so to provide more time for that is ultimately, as we've discussed, the purpose of using these tools, ultimately for me anyway. And I feel like with the idea of teaching becoming more and more aligned with coaching, I think that's a fascinating consequence of the last couple of years and the rise of technology to enhance and augment what we do. But as Emma says, at the heart of this, why are we trying to coach more? Why is there that shift to this? And the name of the author escapes me. I think the book's called Drive, where the author talks about the importance to provide spaces and experiences to practice towards and have autonomy to practice mastery with purpose and the name of it will come to me in a minute and i'll ping it into the chat but ultimately that intrinsic motivation as it were that emma so rightly talks about to teach our students to be those independent learners to forage and curate and discover and to be self-motivated is what we want to instill in our learners I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship with the old sage on the stage, direct. I'm doing it now, ironically, to 58 of you. But this, but I do wonder about how impactful it is. I remember teaching about two years ago. I had a good lesson. It was on a clockwork orange. And it was about censorship. And I thought it was a good lesson, good slides, really dynamic, really a bit edgy, a bit interesting. I remember looking out into the, the 30 people in the lecture theatre and just thinking they're not they're, they're gone. I've been talking 20 minutes and they're gone. And I, I, at that point, I thought, I'm not bad at this. I can teach now. After five years or so, you start to think, ah, you know, I'm getting all right at this. And it really upset me. And it really got to me. Um, and I really reflected deeply on it. And I realised that for a lot of those learners, particularly learners I was working with, it wasn't appropriate to talk for that amount of time. They wanted to do things, they wanted to interact, they wanted to create, they wanted to consolidate, they wanted to a challenge, they wanted to play with what we just discovered together. And I was depriving them of that by just doing the, uh, the routine of going through the slides. There is a time for it, absolutely, direct um, instruction, but getting that balance right of the direct instruction and then the one-to-ones that's where we are right now i suppose isn't it in terms of that delicate nuanced dance of pedagogy and understanding what's best for our learners at any given time and all figuring it out together aren't we definitely definitely thank you scott for this for this lovely addition and i think it's it's time to move on to our second part because we already feel that we're speaking on that how can edtech empower teachers meaning how can we ensure that edtech stays at the service of pedagogy and not the other way around of course and again scott let's start with you what are your insights that you'd love to share i think it can empower teachers by allowing them to be freed of the pressure of being the sole arbiter of knowledge that I once thought the teacher was. Like they'd put their hand out and we just gobble up the truth that they present from their PowerPoint, as it were. And I taught like that at first, um, because I thought that's what teachers do. But I realized, because I worked in the media industry for a little bit, and I still do every now and then little bits and bobs. And 
I realized that the way I learned was by, you know, videos and doing things and using Twitter and social media and interacting with people. And I started to bring that to the classroom. And that's what I started to do, really. And that's how it started to change for me and the way I approach things. And I think that that freed up me from being the one everyone was looking to, to do the teaching and learning at the show, as it were. It started to become about us as a team learning together, as opposed to me feeling the pressure of putting on a show, as it were, which is how I felt. Which, well, I mean, maybe it says something about me, I don't know, but I know a lot of teachers feel that way. And observations as well, which are very prominent um, in schools and colleges in England, in terms of um, judging us as teachers and our value. We often get ob observed and that decides, and there's a lot of pressure involved in that. I think EdTech empowers teachers in the sense that it helps us to realise the responsibility for the learning is everyone's, I suppose. With these tools facilitate these group collaborative creative activities and tasks whereby everyone is co-designing co-creating problem solving and particularly for me talking from a college perspective doing things that they'll be doing in their respective industries so when we have the automotive students creating videos of themselves doing a service of a car in their teams that's what they're doing in their careers and the teachers facilitating that when we have the public services students working radio mics and working on spreadsheets and chat tools and Google Maps to um, diffuse a terrorist situation and terrorist threat, that is being facilitated by the teacher who is walking around making sure everyone's okay. They are not at the front just speaking. Um, it becomes an empowering tool because it, I believe, and from what I've observed, empowers the teacher to have other people co-create the lesson, co-create the learning. Thank you, Scott. Very interesting sharings here. And please, Emma, feel free to share your viewpoints as well. Thank you so much, Annalise and Scott. So, yes, it, it this question of uh, co-creation, I think, is a really interesting one and really important. And what Scott has highlighted, I think, that this idea that you're on the stage and performing and uh, passively imparting knowledge, we we need to move beyond that. Not only because we need uh, to think about how we learn actively, and again, I, I don't want to. That's not to undermine this idea that we need uh, knowledge bases and everything should be discovery, and we shouldn't have a direct instruction. But I think we're coming to this idea of being co-investigators and co-discoverers in a classroom setting. And it makes me think to the that moment when you're seen as the fountain of all knowledge and you have to be right and you're, you're stood at the front on the whiteboard and you're asked a question what, by whatever student and then there's that bit, you, you know, the this this moment when you write whatever it is behind you and you think, oh my goodness, everything everyone's writing this down and taking this as, as gospel. And this idea that we can't, it, it, we can't suggest actually that's a really interesting question i'm not sure about that why don't we go and check and i think that um opportunity it's not it's not a humility it's not a fragility it's a it's again it goes back to that human uh ability to show that we're all on a similar journey but just at different stages of it and it, then it comes back to an element i really wanted to think about and share today is this idea of coming back to what is education doing? It's to set us up to flourish in society. So what do we need to be able to do? We need to uh, have that, uh, those, that metacognitive awareness. We need to have that scaffolding for critical questioning so that we can reflect on what we already know and maybe revisit it, um, connect it with what we're faced with um, critique it, uh, ask sort of reason questions, and then come to the creation point where we think, okay, we've we've gone through these stages, and that now we've arrived at what we um, believe is a sort of knowledge base, and that comes to this information changing something from information to knowledge, and there being a difference between the two. So yes, I think absolutely, it's it can be a real empowerment because then you've got this sense that that there's no way in which we can hold 
the themes and themes of information that are being um, a, a knowledge to, to take that other term that are being built upon on a daily basis. So once we accept that and we can say that, you know, we, we don't come to us as um, being the only resource, we're one resource of many, but let's think about how you can go about what right, how do you identify what you don't know and then find the right tools for the right job to find out what you would like to know. That's great. Scott, would you like to react on that? Yeah, I wonder about things like ego as well, Emma, in terms of a lot of teachers. Now, I, I do wonder about the willingness of some teachers to let go of that, you know, being the front of all knowledge. And it's quite, you know, I felt I was guilty of it at times as well, um, where I thought, I know this, I've got good qualifications in it, I've done it, and I know this. So, you know, 16 year olds, let me know what I know, I'm going to put on and and let them know what I think. And it is, and I think that to go back, it is a dent to the ego almost for some educators, from what I've observed, whereby they allow themselves to be questioned and to be vulnerable and to allow themselves to make mistakes alongside in real time uh putting the train track in front of the train as it were in the lesson to go off on tangents and to embrace the chaos of those incredible lessons where people do question things and you do just follow um the train of thought down the rabbit hole as it were and that 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 requires um i suppose a different train of thought a different approach in to the way we educate and i wonder about teacher training and whether that facilitates this willingness to embrace and facilitate the these environments whereby it's you know when it's a great lesson when that, that energy that indefinable energy where the buzz is just electric and you can feel it you can feel the synapses connect in people's minds and that often comes from following that energy in the room as it were and I wonder whether many teachers are taught or given their scaffolding themselves in education to actually facilitate those environments rather as opposed to what I have seen in teacher education. I used to teach teachers in the evenings whereby the specifications were very much about how to get your PowerPoints looking a particular so and somewhat more prosaic. And I think teacher education perhaps needs to evolve as well from what I've seen. I think that's a really important point. The it, teacher training, that's what it, it comes back to. And that was the the other thing that really comes to the fore for me when we're thinking about the relationship between ed tech and teachers. We talked, uh, up until this point, we've talked quite a lot about the pedagogy that of course needs to come first. But then it, we come back to if uh, teachers are going to be the gatekeepers, the curators, the people who are pointing towards the right tools for the job or the most appropriate tools, uh, within this sort of oncoming or ongoing, um, we have to say a deluge because there's, a, I mean, EdTech is mushrooming and the, the mm. number of products uh, that are available and the different, there's so many tools that do slightly different jobs in different arenas and there's some really exciting opportunities. But to be able to sort that digital wheat from the digital chaff, you have to have a sense of uh, a, a strategy, right? To, to, um, to know how we're going to pair the education and technology trajectories. And, and that's certainly, that's part of my work at the minute is working on CPD programs to connect these dots up because it is, it's so important. We can't expect educators who uh, are in the classroom and in the business of getting through curriculum and huge time pressures and resources mm -hmm. and required to do so. Now, and that it, it, you you um, handicap someone if you don't start at the beginning by saying, okay, but what's take one? Let's let's take let's take WooClap as an example here. You know, there's a real understanding of how formative feedback on a testing of knowledge and spaced repetition uh, is really important for learning, mm. and the ability for the teacher to oversee that and ask questions in different ways. Now there, if you're going into, rather than saying, okay, I, I've, this is a, a tool that's come onto my radar, I'm gonna use it. But you can think, okay, why, why this one rather than that? Just like you would go and buy a car for one purpose rather than another. And I think we, we, we forget that, that ability to differentiate and make informed, empowered choices should be 
the prerogative of teachers who are in the classroom because they're the best placed. They know when you're on the front line of education, you know exactly what your students need. So we should be connecting that up, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The biggest thing we had, Emma, uh, at our college was when we started to work with student digital leaders who worked with me to actually train up teachers across the college. And we found that going back to ego again, uh, of teachers who were perhaps un not willing to admit that they needed help using different tools. When we work with student digital leaders, interestingly, our teachers who were suckers for the students because they love the students, no matter how um, hard bitten they may become throughout their careers, you know, our students will always, always melt them really. And that helped us enormously to train up all the staff at our college. And that was really helping us to empathize from the perspective of the student as well because they'd be training up the teachers and showing them different things that worked for them uh, youtubers influencers social media platforms games fitbit watches things that help to keep them engaged engaged um david newland said in the comments here about something that struck a nerve with me about teachers and how to avoid nice idea but completely wrong without demoralizing students god i remember that when i was at school like being demoralized by my teachers who just didn't listen or were demoralized me by just not being not listening to me or giving me a chance to let me learn in a way I was familiar with. I love learning, but I hated school. I was anxious and nervous all the time. I was talking to my mum about it the other day. Um, she said to me about the things that I do now in my career, and I think I'm spending my entire career trying to right the wrongs of my childhood in terms of um, education because it wasn't good enough. And I know it wasn't good enough. So I'm, I'm, I was a good kid. I wanted to learn. And I felt like I was not given the opportunity or the platforms to learn. And I think going back to your question here about EdTech empowering teachers. Yeah, but as, as students as well. If the teachers enable it, it can empower students. And if the, we listen to students and let them show us things, that is enormous. And anything good I've done in my career is because I've listened to students and they've shown me cool things that have helped me to go, oh, wow. That's better than what I was planning, actually. Can you show me? Can you do it? And that's so important. It's lovely when students feel empowered to do that because we're all learning alongside each other, aren't we, really? Definitely. Definitely. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Emma, for sharing with us your insights and, and expertise on, on that topic. I'm recalling two major points here. The first would be to fly your educational nest with experience of mastery learning and having a good learning coach but also having the feeling as a team where edtech empowers the teachers and be as well co-investigators and co-creators of learning with your students as well now i think it's time to move on to um the questions so we still have some time left and let's see if we have some questions to to the speakers and um, Emma and Scott, do feel free if you see something that interests you in terms of questions to take it up. I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat as well. And I'm, I'm seeing the, the question on nice idea, but completely wrong. I'd love to address that if I may. Do go ahead, do go ahead. It, that's a really that's a really interesting one, isn't it? Because you, I, it makes me think of um, a very very generous violin teacher I had when I was a child, and um, she would never tell me I was doing anything wrong. And curiously, that made me quite frustrated because then I wasn't, mm. I didn't know how to improve. Because on the one, all the art teacher who looked at my pieces of art and told me, "Oh, good eye for colour, Emma," when I was looking at it, thinking. Mm, I'm not uh, I might have put lots of colors I'm not sure it was expert use of the colors and the challenge with that is if you're so yes uh there was the real motivation to support and motivate but somehow it did the reverse because what I think I would have benefited from in both those instances were oh that it, why did you choose that so it goes back mm. to that critical question what is the process and then we come to this idea of procedural knowledge which is so important um, and we often think of that sitting within discipline so how do we do history how do we do chemistry but actually what why why can't we bring this and um, and make it a bit more general and say that's the that's the opportunity where we can as educators say okay 
Um, I actually thought something different. So the uh, let's say there is a very hard and fast that answer. So I don't want to, there is gray middle areas and I could, I'm sure we could discuss that for hours on end. But of course there are times when there's a right or wrong, right? So then we come back to, okay, so the, the process, how did you reach at that point? Did you just guess? Okay, what are the other ways in which we can get to that? And I think there is the opportunity to come back to that metacognitive piece again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, there's a teacher in the chat actually called Alexandra House, who's an ESOL teacher, English speakers of other languages um, mm. in Leeds in England, an exceptional teacher who is excellent at those me metacognitive um, uses of ed tech and questioning why, what, where, when, how. And I've seen her use tools like um, Jamboard, an interactive whiteboard tool with her students to challenge their use of um, uh, the past tense and present tense and having people collaborate in real time. And what you're saying just reminds me of Alex's practice, who's a personification of that sort of teacher. Um, she's blushing, bless her. That's lovely. She's a wonderful teacher and the future of education. She really is. Um, Zoe Baker, is, is Zoe, did I work with you in Basingstoke? Is it that Zoe Baker or are you another Zoe Baker? Um, you say completely agree with your comments about teacher ego. Yeah, it's interesting, that isn't it? I think I probably revealed a bit too much about myself there in terms of my <laughs> ego um, when I started. But I suppose it's, um, that's all I knew really. I thought that's what teachers are supposed to be. But I only started to get, I suppose a little bit better at teaching was when the students were showing things and they were leading on things and I was just another guy in the room helping to facilitate that's when it really started to flourish and of course there's a place for that scaffolding and the direct learning and the um, the challenge as Emma craved as a young violinist or in art class for example absolutely there is but at the same time when those teachers do work alongside you and ideate and iterate and problem solve as a teammate as well the ability for the teacher to be that teammate and then to be that instructor and to go fluently between the two that takes high levels of emotional intelligence from a lot of teachers and that's a skill set that i feel we're only just recently starting to value in culturally certainly in england in terms of empathy and what gerd leonard the futurist calls core skills not soft skills core skills uh, compassion originality reputation and empathy i love that yeah. core skills uh good leonard's brilliant um oh it is it's zoe baker hello zoe baker we all went through it scots <laughs> oh i love that's nice to hear from you lovely. we all did we all did no lovely thank you very much i think as we're reaching to our time limit for the session i do want to thank all of you uh these speakers for your presence during this very insightful and very timely discussion. And do not forget, indeed, the emotional intelligence that is required throughout. And to our audience, if you haven't already signed up for the other sessions, make sure to check them out on our website. There are still some seats left and the next session will be hosted in a different room. So please click on the link you received by email to access that room and we'll see you there to listen to Timothy Skelton, Lead Practitioner in E-Learning at New College Durham, Peter Roberts, E-Learning Systems Manager at Goldsmiths University of London, and Isam Babukan, Learning Consultant at Microsoft and E-Learning Manager at City of Westminster College to discuss about how to tackle the dispersion of tools. So thank you so much for your participation and we are looking forward to see you all in the other sessions. And please, Scott and Emma, do go ahead and thank the audience as well if you'd like and leave a little conclusion word. Yeah, over to you, Scott. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, everyone. It's really difficult to find the time at the moment, isn't it, this time of year to join webinars and to be and to be engaged as well. So nice to see the chat and um, to feel like we were together doing it, which is um, what all these online sessions should be, really. So thank you so much for taking the time and hope you're all healthy and well. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. And it's been a real pleasure. And I, I, 
as you were saying, you know, this idea of being we're all co-learners and all of this. So it's 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 uh, been wonderful to have the opportunity to try this out a little bit and and hear your responses. And I suppose the final thing I'd say is it makes me think of the digital native, digital immigrant uh, categories. Now that's a whole other debate in itself, of course, but let's let's take one thing from it that remember that our students can teach us much, just as much as we can teach them. So, um, and that's the wonder of education. So uh, aren't we all so lucky <laughs> to be in this context? And, and thanks so much to all of you and uh, happy teaching and learning for the rest of the uh, days and weeks and uh, the summer. Thank you so much. See you soon, hopefully, and back to the other sessions. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.